So let's take a quick look at classifying primates. How you know? So now we talked about apes. We talked about monkeys a little bit, um, and we'll take a look at varying species here in a little bit. Um, so let's talk about how do we classify all these things. So let's say you find a new species of primate out in the jungle. Well, how do you know if it's a monkey or an ape or a prosimian? We break up our um, primate family tree into two basic groups. You have strepsirines versus haplorines, right? And, you know, knowing having the word rhine on the end, you know it relates to their um, noses. You have strepsirines, which are primates that have snouts, like our lemurs and our lorises. Their faces are a little bit longer. They have a little bit more of a reliance on smell. And then you have your haplorines that have flatter faces and not as a reliance on smell. Things like your tarsiers, your new world monkeys, your old world monkeys, and your apes. So our haplorine primates, or the plural pronunciation is haplorini, um, our haplorini primates include our old world monkeys, our new world monkeys, our apes, and um, some will classify tarsiers there. And we're actually going to find out that tarsiers are a bit difficult to classify, depending on the primatologists that you ask. Some will classify them in the strepsirini category, and some of them will classify them in the haplorini category. It's because tarsiers have an interesting mix of primitive and derived um, traits, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, your haplorini in general are your dry nose primates, right? We do not have any moisture on the surface of our noses. The noses are frontal facing and the nostrils present as tiny slits. Our wet nose primates on the other hand, or our strepsirenes, have very large open nostrils and the nostrils may actually be laterally facing or on the sides of the nose um, and this includes our lorises, our lemurs, and depending on who you ask sometimes our tarsiers. So the classification of primates, there are a few different uh, different classification systems. If you're looking at an older kind of book, um, you're going to see the difference um, between prosimians versus anthropoids, right? This is the same classification as strepsirine versus haplorine, right? Your prosimians are your strepsirines. Your anthropoids are your haplorines, right? So the prosimians would be your lemurs, lorises, and tarsiers, and your anthropoids would be your monkeys, your apes, and your humans. So I was just showing you a prosimian uh, lemur and an anthropoid, like your uh, little bonobo here. Our prosimians, these were the first primates to evolve at or around 55 million years ago. They later gave rise to the anthropoid primates, uh, which is a group that includes monkeys, apes, and humans. And the living prosimians are a strange and interesting group. And they are sometimes called living fossils because they haven't changed a whole lot um, since they have become isolated on Madagascar. So one of the most popular prosimians uh, slash strepsirines that we see uh, most often is the ring-tailed lemurs. So many prosimians are nocturnal, which means they are active at night. Our ring-tailed lemurs are one of the few examples of a diurnal uh, prosimian, which means that they are active during the day. And prosimians include species like uh, your various species of lemurs, um, the ii, the lorises, bush babies, as well as tarsiers. So go ahead and follow this link to watch a um, informational yet uh, humorous video on the II. So the primitive traits that distinguish uh, prosimians from your anthropoid or your haplorine primates, they have a long muzzle with a wet nose. They have tactile verbrisse, which means they have whiskers. Um, they have a frontal limb that tethers the upper lip. This is essentially a piece of tissue that kind of anchors the upper lip to the rest of the face, and it makes um, essentially makes it so that they don't have a whole lot of innervation in their face, and they don't have a whole lot of muscle movement in their face. Um, they have a toilet claw on the second toy, toe that is used for exactly what you think it is used for. It's used uh, to assist in going to the bathroom. They have a post-orbital bar only on their skull. They have a two-part frontal bone and a two-part mandible, right? We're going to notice that when we look at a lot of monkey species, we're going to see that the, um, the mandible is all one piece, right? The jawbone is all one piece. But when we look at prosimians, like our lemurs, the jawbone is actually in two pieces, as well as having this mandibular tooth comb in most species of prosimians. And that's a very um, kind of interesting dental adaptation where the bottom incisors and canines of the uh, mandible 
stick out almost perpendicularly to the rest of the jaw. And we'll take a look at a picture here in a minute. Um, but where you can see the little stars or the little asterisks there, um, those those are features that are different in tarsiers, right? This is why we have such a hard time classifying which grouping tarsiers should go into. So this is showing you the tooth comb that we see. You can see that it sticks out perpendicular from the rest of the um, jaw. And that tooth comb includes the incisors and the canine tooth, right? Um, because remember, the uh, dental formula for prosimians is 2, 1, 2, 3, right? So you can see up in the top left-hand corner here, the two incisors on one side, the one canine, and then what looks like that big kind of sharp tooth, that's what we call a procumbent first premolar, right? It's actually set forward, and it's a lot sharper than most premolars that we see. This is showing you a uh, ring-tailed lemur that's kind of um, uh, going under surgery, and you can see the tooth comb uh, right in the front, right? It almost looks like it's one solid fused tooth. Prosimians have the greatest diversity of these are the lemurs that live on Madagascar. And just 2,000 years ago, there were at least 45 different species of lemurs ranging in size from 100 kilograms or 100 grams rather to 240 kilograms, right, which is huge. Now, none of them weigh more than 10 kilos. So that shows you kind of the effect that island habitats have on species over successive generations, right? They tend to shrink in size and they tend to decrease in the amount of species variability. So this is just showing you uh, one of the largest lemur species around 2000 years ago was the Megalodapus. And you can see it's as big as a modern day gorilla. But we have others like our very small injuries, which is our largest kind of lemur that we see today on uh, Madagascar. And then our smallest, which is the mouse lemur. So much like our finches from uh, Darwin's original study, the lemurs of Madagascar evolved to fill many different ecological niches normally occupied by other groups of mammals on the mainland. So we have very small lemurs that eat exclusively insects. We have larger lemurs that eat a mix of fruit and uh, insects. And we have other lemurs that eat uh, vegetation exclusively. So just showing you uh, just some pictures of some lemurs here. And you can see they don't look like there's a whole lot of expression in the face, right? They kind of give you that deadpan stare. And that's because of that frenulum that tethers the upper lip to the face. They don't have a whole lot of muscle movement that capability in their faces. So many prosimians move by vertical clinging and leaping. In the last slide, you can kind of see them clinging to the side of a branch, um, and they leap off and from branch to branch. Um, as a matter of fact, in the top left corner, you can see an individual. Um, this particular species of, um, I believe this is an injury. These injuries, um, uh, one of the things they like to do is they climb up to the certain species of tree on Madagascar that oozes this kind of toxic sap that will make them intoxicated. Um, so they go up there, they grab some of that sap, they rub it all over themselves, they sniff it, they lick it, they, they kind of uh, roll in it. Um, and the end result of that is it essentially makes them high. I mean, some of them have gotten so intoxicated they've fallen out of the tree. So all lemurs have a tapetum uh, lucidum and probably have very limited colored vision. Um, the tapetum lucidum is actually a very interesting adaptation that most mammals have. It's a layer in the eye that reflects light. Um, you can see it at nighttime when you look at your cat's eyes and you can see that glow in the eyes. Um, that is the tapetum lucidum. Prosimians rely heavily on olfactory cues and have very large nasal cavities and olfactory bulbs compared to that of other primates. The wet nose on their rhinarium or their kind of, um, uh, the wet noses indicates a um, heavier reliance on smell. So this is just showing you the tapetum lucidum layer in a cow eyeball, right? So you can kind of see its reflective surface. And then you can see a nocturnal lemur here. Um, and you can see the tapetum lucidum shining in their eyes, right? So the purpose is to collect the light and reflect it back so that they can see better at night. So lemurs themselves are seasonal breeders. Some uh, small ones are generally solitary, where larger ones can be very social. The small ones eat mostly insects and small reptiles and are nocturnal. The large ones have a more diverse diet and are generally diurnal. So this is showing some of our smaller ones, like our little bush baby 
as well as um, our smaller, uh, I believe that's a mouse lemur. Showing you some of our larger ones like our Indri and our Shifarala here. If we look at lower season bush babies, they are all nocturnal. All of them live in Africa and they are all arboreal, very small body. So here's a slender loris, right? And lorises are actually interesting. Lorises are the only primate that is venomous. Um, as a matter of fact, on the slender loris here, there is a little barb. You can't really see it in these picture, pictures, but on, there's a little barb on the elbow. And if you get stabbed with that barb, it injects you with a very um, kind of potent neurotoxin. Here's a bush baby, right? Um, very, very small body size. Even these tiny little babies will fit inside kind of the palm of your hand. Very slow, different types of lorises here. You have a slow loris, you have a slender loris, and a pygmy slow loris. So you can see how highly related they are because they look very similar to one another. Your tarsiers all live in island areas in Southeast Asia. They are all nocturnal and very small bodies. Uh, they've never uh, been seen to eat plants, just different anthropods and snakes, right? So they're, they eat different reptiles and uh, shellfish as well as insects. Um, because of their dry noses and other traits, they, are, they don't really easily fit into the prosimian suborder, but they also don't really fit into the um, haplorini or the anthropoidian order as well. So I was just showing you a tires here. They're very kind of freaky looking creatures. Um, as a matter of fact, I think here in the next slide, I'll give you an opportunity to watch a video on the tarsiers, it's a humorous video, but it's, um, it kind of shows you um, essentially uh, their, uh, the one big feature that we really look at with tarsiers is how large their eyes are. As a matter of fact, they're the largest in relation to their brain in the primate order. So let's move on to our anthropoids, right? Our monkeys, our apes, and our humans. The earliest anthropoids were first seen at about 45 to 50 million years ago in Asia. They later colonized Africa, which at that point was an island by then. And your anthropoid primates are grouped into two general groups, your platyrrhines and your catarrhines. Your platyrrhines are your New World monkeys. They have round nostrils that point out to the sides, and adults have 12 premolars, right? Because remember, your New World monkeys have the 2133 dental pattern. Your catarrhines, on the other hand, are your Old World monkeys, apes, and humans. We have compressed downward-facing nostrils, and the adults have eight premolars. So you can see kind of the difference in nostril shape here. Our new world monkey here on the left and our old world monkey on the right here. Um, as a matter of fact, I believe it's a baboon species on the right and a howler monkey on the left. Um, so you can see how there's a big difference. Uh, so old world monkeys, apes, and humans nostrils are very close together. They're downward, they're compressed. Um, and the new world mo uh, monkey nostrils are very well separated, kind of large gape, you know, open holes on the front of the face. So the distinguishing characteristics that we see in the anthropoids are a reduced muzzle, except in baboons, and a dry nose, no prominent whiskers, we have flat nails on all digits, we have a fused frontal bones as well as a fused mandible bone, it's all in one piece. We do not have any tooth combs, there is a retina with a fovea, which is especially good for acute vision. Um, where is a cerebral cortex with a central sulcus, and this is actually very important. We're going to see that the more intelligent a species is, the further back that central sulcus is from the front of the brain. As a matter of fact, we're looking at a portion of a human brain here, um, and that central sulcus is pretty far back, and that means we have a very um, we have a large degree of area in the front part of the brain, which is the kind of area where problem solving and thinking goes on. Uh, there's also a thumb and a big opposable toe as well. This is just showing you the flat nails on, on all of our digits. Characteristics of our monkeys within this uh, particular part of the primate family tree. Monkeys have very long backs. Their chests, if you look at them from above, are round rather, rather than barrel-shaped. Um, in apes and in humans, our chests are barrel-shaped. Uh, their scapula are placed more laterally on the side than we see in apes and humans. They have tails, and in some New World monkeys like um, holler monkeys, they have prehensile tails, right, which actually function as limbs. 
They have below fondant uh, molars with uh, four distinct cusps, and most monkeys move quadrupedally and have a smaller range of motion at the shoulder than our hominoids do, which are, are apes. So looking at some of our New World monkeys, our platyrrhines, they are all arboreal, and none of them are very large, and which makes a lot of sense because they're living in these New World jungles, which are very dense. Some world New World monkeys have prehensile tails, um, like our howler monkeys. So there are no uh, cases of extreme sexual dimorphism in terms of body size or real appearance in our New World monkeys. Most of our New World monkeys are primarily, primarily frugivorous, eating various fruits. Only howler monkeys and murakees, um, which are two highly related species, eat a lot of leaves. That's about a 50-50 mix of leaves and fruit. So let's look at some of the different families that we see in our anthropoids. We have the Cibidae family, which includes Goldies monkeys, Marmosets, Tamarins, Squirrel monkeys, and Capuchin monkeys, all of which are New World monkeys. This is showing you some of our Goldies monkeys. Marmosets are specialized to eat tree gum, right? They actually have a special claw on their toes, and they're a bit more primitive than a lot of our other New World monkeys. As a matter of fact, if you look at the one in the top uh, left corner here, looks a lot like a lemur does. So there are some of our tamarins. They don't really rely on gum. Actually, a lot of them eat a fair degree of insects. Marmosets and tamarins uh, routinely give birth to twins. They are one of the few primate species that routinely give birth to twins. Um, and males uh, have a high degree of invest, uh, parental investment, actually as equally in some cases more than the females do. Just showing you some more of our little tamarins. Showing you uh, some squirrel monkeys here, very small body. They travel in very large social groups, up to 60 to 100 of them at a time. Um, and they eat a lot of different insects as well as fruit. So our capuchins are sometimes called the New World Apes because they are so intelligent and they do have the capacity to use tools. They eat fruit, insects, and small reptiles and are very, very ingenious in their food collection. As a matter of fact, um, uh, capuchin monkeys are capable of grabbing uh, rocks and using them to crack open various nuts. So note that the capuchin's typical New World monkey nostrils. So this is showing you a capuchin using a rock to smash open a nut. If we look at another family that we see in the New World monkeys, where they have the Attilidae family, which includes howler monkeys, owl monkeys, sp uh, spider monkeys, murakis, uakaris, titi monkeys, uh, woolly monkeys, and white-faced sockies monkeys, like we see in the picture here. Howler monkeys eat leaves and fruit. As we said, it's about a 50-50 mix. And howler monkeys, the reason they're called howler monkeys is because they are one of the loudest animals in the animal kingdom. Their uh, calls can be heard from miles and miles away. And the reason they do this is because, well, their diet consists primarily of leaves, which doesn't provide a whole lot of energy. So in the morning when they wake up, they do these long distance calls to scare away other primate species and to scare away potential predators and things like that so that they can sit in their trees and eat in relative peace. Howlers and murky monkeys are our largest of the New World monkeys. They weigh anywhere from 15 to 22 pounds, um, which is kind of interesting because they are the ones that kind of eat the most leaves, right? So, and there's a reason for that. Their large bodies um, actually contain a lot of guts, right? A lot of intestines and a lot of, um, you know, extra space in the stomach, which is needed for processing all of that plant material. This is showing a murky leaping from one tree to another. Note the prehensile tail. Howler monkeys have this as well, and it's used as a balancing as well as an extra grabbing appendage. All of your New World monkeys are diurnal except for the aptly named owl monkey. Woolly monkeys and spider monkeys eat more fruit than howlers and murakis do, right? Woolly monkey being on the left and your spider monkey being on the right. 
And then you have uh, uakaris. These are a male and a female uakari, and uakaris are not very well studied because they live in a very inaccessible, swampy terrain. As a matter of fact, um, one of the exciting things um, at the Cleveland uh, Metropolitan or uh, Metro Park Zoo um, was when they acquired a male and a female uakari. I'm showing you a baby uakari. This is a male and a female white face sake, the male on the right and the female on the left. They have very powerful jaws and are one of the biggest seed dispersers for many tropical rainforest plants. This is, and this kind of uh, brings another up another point. Primate species are exceptionally important because they disperse seeds throughout the forest, right? The same reason why a lot of bird species are very important because they disperse seeds. A lot of trees and a lot of plants have become actually evolutionarily dependent upon these creatures spreading their seeds in order to kind of propagate and continue to survive. So looking at our old world monkeys, so moving away from uh, the new world in South America, moving over to Africa and Southeast Asia, all of our old world monkeys have ischial callosities as well as our lesser apes. Um, and this is a very fancy way for saying butt pads, right? We all have uh, muscle tissue and fat tissue on our derrieres in order to sit. Right? It's thought to be adapted for sitting and many species have become adapted to living on the ground. This is showing you an Isiochlossidae, which is a leathery pad that the animal sits on. This is a very large um, mandrel baboon. There are two main subdivisions of old world monkeys. You have the Colobinase and the Circopithecines, right? The Colobinase are the leaf monkey subgroup, and this includes colobus monkeys, proboscis monkeys, leaf monkeys, snub-nosed monkeys, and langers. The Circopithecines, or the Gwenin group of monkeys, include swamp monkeys, mangabays, Gwenins, patas monkeys, macaques, mandrels, and baboons. And just to give you uh, an idea, I'm not going to expect you to know all the different species of New World versus Old World monkeys. I want you guys to focus primarily on what differentiates them from one another. If we look at the colobines, this is your leaf monkeys, except for the African colobus monkey, all of the colobines live in India or Southeast Asia. Most leaf monkeys are arboreal, except for some populations of the Hudeman langers. All leaf monkeys include some proportion of leaves in their diet, but only a few can be regarded as truly specialized leaf eaters, right? And these would be the proboscis monkeys, the purple-faced langer, and the black and white colobus monkeys. This is showing you the proboscis monkey. Proboscis actually means nose, so it's kind of very aptly named, right? He's got that big schnoz. Um, this is showing you the purple-faced langer, which kind of looks like a grumpy old person. We also have the black and white colobus monkey. These are actually um, a very delicious and tasty treat for chimpanzees. It's the um, pretty much the main protein meat source that chimpanzees like to hunt. And they're regarded as specialized leaf feeders because they have additional um, elements on their and additional glands on their uh, gastric region, which allow for a more proficient breakdown of plant cellulose, right? That kind of difficult material in plants that is hard to digest. So the Circopithecine group, all of them are restricted to Africa, except the macaques, which have a very, very wide range in Asia. Their terrestrial locomotion and ground feeding are a common in species inhabiting the woodland savannas of Africa. The Gwenins, uh, on the other hand, are mostly forest living. So these are different species of macaques, um, and we talked a little bit earlier about macaques. You have uh, Macaca nemestrina, Macaca fuchsia, right? There are also, you know, the pigtail cac, you have the Japanese snow macaque, right? There's a whole bunch of different species of macaques. This is showing a mandrel, a patas monkey, and an olive baboon. All of these are largely terrestrial, meaning they live on the ground, and some terrestrial forms have dramatic Si uh, sexual dimorphism and size, particularly your baboons. The baboon males are very, very large, and the baboon females are very, very small. And this is because there's very, very um, high degrees of competition between males and baboon species over access to females. As a matter of fact, there will be about 20 to 30 females per each male baboon, depending on the species, uh, as what he calls kind of his harem, right? Um, and those females will only exclusively uh, mate with the kind of alpha male. 
Uh, we have Galata baboons are the most terrestrial primate of all. They live in Ethiopia. They feed and move exclusively on the ground, and they sleep up on cliff faces at night. So this is just showing you different species of Gwenons, all of which live in forest areas. And kind of coming full circle here, we'll talk about our hominoids, right, which are our apes and the humans. We have larger brains than monkeys, a Y5 pattern on our lower molars. We have broad, more flattened barrel chests. Our scapula are placed more dorsally or more on the back of our bodies rather than on the sides. We have a short and relatively stiff back. Our backs and our spines are not as flexible as monkeys because we're not spending as much time in the trees. We have long arms with flexible joints and, of course, no tails. None of our apes and our humans have tails. So looking at our apes and humans, this includes things from our chimpanzees and our orangutans and our bonobos to our gorillas and, of course, our humans. The lesser apes, uh, there's two basic categories. You have great apes and lesser apes. Your lesser apes include your brachiators, like your gibbons and your siamangs. And your great apes include your gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, and, of course, humans. There are two distinct species of chimpanzees that we'll talk about throughout the semester. We have pan troglodytes and you have pan paniscus, right? Pan troglodytes are kind of your classic chimpanzee, and pan paniscus um, are sometimes referred to as bonobos. This is showing an orangutan, which is an Asian great ape. This is actually a very large male. Um, you can tell it's a male by the very large throat sac that you can see underneath his chin there. It's used to make a very long distance call to try and attract females for mating. If we look at hominoid locomotion, the scapulae are dorsal with a socket for the humerus facing to the side. There's lots of movement allowed at this joint. Our arms can go in many directions, right? The hominoid ancestor was probably an arboreal climber. Gibbons and siamangs are lesser uh, apes locomote by brachiation or arm swinging. There are not, or arms are enormously long. They're much longer than their legs. And these animals uh, essentially move by being suspended by their arms and move underneath the branches. Orangs, on the other hand, or orangutans, they have very flexible hips and their feet uh, and hands are very similar to each other. So we refer to this as being quadrimanual, right? They are the happiest moving in the trees. Our African apes, on the other hand, are, are uh, our chimps and our gorillas are knuckle walkers, which is a kind of terrestrial quadrupedalism in which the weight is on the feet and on the knuckles of the hands. So this is showing you our gibbons and our siamangs, our lesser apes brachiating as a form of locomotion. They're, they have very long curved finger bones and very, very long arms. As a matter of fact, in most cases, their arms are longer than their legs. Showing you some orangs moving around the trees. The females rarely come down to the ground, whereas the males will come down to the ground to patrol their territory. And uh, orangs are very solitary creatures, right? You will never really see more than two of them living together at a time, right? And those two are usually a mother and a child, right? The males are entirely solitary. So the males can get very big and will come down to move to uh, the ground from one stand of trees to the next as they patrol their very large territories. And if it is a male that has reproduced many times, you will see that it develops that very large kind of fat pads on the side of its face there. You can see that kind of ridge uh, on each side of the face. If they do not mate regularly, they may actually never develop um, that secondary sexual characteristic. This is showing you uh, an orang on the ground uh, doing what we call fist walking, which is where they walk on the backs of their hands rather than on their knuckles. And this is showing you um, uh, on the other side, you have chimps and gorillas, which knuckle walk. You can see that that chimp is putting all of his weight on his knuckles. Showing you a young gorilla uh, knuckle walking, more knuckle walking. And of course, we have humans, right? Our extinct bipedal ancestors are also in this family, and we move around by bipedalism, right, which is walking on two limbs. And we'll talk about this in much, much more detail in a few weeks. So let's look at the distinguishing characteristics of the hominidae and wrap it up for this lecture. We have reduced canine length. We have a non-prehensile big toe. Right? So this is essentially pretty much talking about humans. Our pelvis and knees show anatomical adaptations for bipedality. We have extreme brain enlargement and elaboration in modern humans, but not all of our extinct 
bipedal ancestors, right? So, and we'll talk about um, who those bipedal distinct, extinct ancestors are, as well as the development of bipedalism, right? And with this, we kind of close our discussion and our lectures on the different types of primates. Be sure to watch the video or the documentary for this week. It'll actually give you a good idea where you get to look at a whole bunch of different primates. And next week, we will get into more detail about primate intelligence, as well as primate uh, social behavior.